Pavel Mihalovich, greetings and nice to meet you. Hello. We have with us today the creator of Neurographica. We are really grateful for taking the time to talk to us. I'm really happy to get to meet you. I've just told Pavel Mihalovich that I've already met him multiple times in real life, but wasn't ready to approach and meet him yet. It's amazing for me that I'm walking around the city and someone might see me, but happens to be so polite that won't interrupt my movement. I'm grateful that there is such a burden sometimes. I finally made up my mind and Pavel has kindly invited us to his marvelous creative space. As I understand, you get inspired here. I once had an oligarch here as a guest and he said, Oh God, you live so modestly, so modestly, and you say it's marvelous. There's so much culture in one place. I haven't met so much in a single place. It's very exciting. We've discussed it, but I want to say for the record that my friend has called Pavel the Freud of Neurographica, and he agrees. I feel pleased as a cat. So maybe we can start with that. Could you please tell how you arrived at this method? Let me first reflect on the neurographic Freud, since this is quite a precise definition, and it's going to help me tell the story. We have to understand that there is such a term as Freud's method, and the fact that I'm a Freud in Neurographica is rather about the fact that I'm a founder of the method. And for a lot of people, it's not clear in what way are a method, a technique, and a technology are different. Such terms are not always obvious for practitioners. A method is a large complex of knowledge that's above science and that has its own philosophy. It's developing a methodology, methodology, philosophy, principles of thought that get united into a sort of a scheme that can be unfolded into technology and into scientific knowledge. So yes, I'm the method author. And it's especially pleasing since my basic education is in architecture. Constructing a complicated construction of a model is aesthetically and creatively pleasing for me. That's why I'm working on methodology in general. And in that sense, yes, I am the Freud of Neurographica. It's pleasant to be among such people as Freud, Jung, Perls, Asagioli, I understand that psychological world is not as rich as it seems to us. In fact, there were not so many schools out there that provided the method and not just their interpretations. Not so many schools in a hundred years. So in this sense, Neurographica is a wonderful thing. It's the first Russian method. And the brand? There is simply no methods in Russian psychology that gains international significance and influence. There are many wonderful schools of science in our psychology that I admire greatly, but no methods. Neurographica is a powerful method in this sense. So how did I arrive at it? Maybe not everyone knows, so we can tell a beautiful legend. When I was studying at the instructor's course, Pavel told the story of how the word Neurographica came to him on the plane over Jerusalem. The actual anecdotal story is a bit more interesting. It's interesting since this happened on April 29th, and what's amazing is that exactly 10 years before, on April 29, 2004, I was flying from Israel to Russia, to Moscow, to live, to work. Exactly 10 years before that, I was flying to Domodedovo airport from Israel to work with a group and so on. And 10 years is not an accident. So it's true that about halfway, half asleep, above the clouds, nowadays I would say at the level of field lines, this word appeared before me. It was a good creative sleep. And you know, dreaming is not only about sleep, a dream is also a wish. And I really like this drowsy, dreamy state. I use it often. Sometimes I advise people who understand what we're talking about to take a nap, since by doing it, we give our brain a chance to process the results of neurographic drawing, to become aware of it. Our imagination is always cooking inside, and sometimes things drop out of it. And on that flight, I guess, the word was done getting cooked and just dropped out. So the method started with a word. Yes, first there was a word. And it's wonderful for a myth. But when people ask me, 
understand that for anything to get cooked, you need ingredients first. And I can say that all my life, I was walking towards Neurographica. One of the ingredients was that my father was an artist. And I was playing with pencils when I was one. Before I played with toy cars, a child is lying down and you give him colored sticks to play. Pencils are just funny little sticks. And nobody bothered about fine motor skills. I was the fourth child, the fourth son. My parents worked at the theater, but that's a different story. So I'm drawing from a really young age. And this is the first imprint in my childhood. I guess this might be interesting for psychologists who work with imprints. Other things I got interested in came later. I started drawing really early in life. Architectural education has allowed me to combine methods. The way I put things together is just architectural principles applied to real life. And my art education didn't end in a cradle. I studied at an art college. So this is your first education? No, I just entered the School of Graphic Arts and studied for two years, but I was doing two diplomas at the same time. So I completed my architectural degree, and the pedagogical degree in art turned out impossible to manage. I kept visiting college to draw. On weekends, when students of architecture were resting, I went to drawing classes of Tamari Gorova in Odessa. She's a legendary painting and drawing teacher. I was always fascinated by it. I was drawing with my father, I was drawing myself, I was making placards and posters at school, I was drawing everywhere all the time, all my life. So I'm an artist in the end. Also it happens that I guess due to my origins or something like that, I love people. And I fall in love easily. I was lucky in love. It's not like I had one love since first grade, till the end of my days. But my heart opens up, I fall in love honestly and sincerely. And with years I learned to fall in love without stalking the objects of my love. My temperament changed, but my love remained. The love for humans in general is what led me to psychology. From architecture, in those hard 90s, I made my way into studying something else. It was out of personal interest. I know myself what a spiritual experience, a satori or samadhi mean. I navigate really well in that. And I decided that I don't want to live outside of that. I don't need anything else without that world. Everything else is rather random. So the rest of my career was related to people, but I don't forget my origins. This thirst for drawing on one side and for working with people on the other are the motifs that ultimately led to the method being born. So on one hand, I can construct as an architect. On the other hand, I did really a lot in the psychological profession. I did a lot of practical work with the most serious people, with companies, with business coaches. I don't feel ashamed for a single project at all. And I did much more work in the previous years that I'm doing right now. Right now I am more mature and calm, and in the past the energy was just gashing out. You know, when something hits you hard, there's almost endless energy. Neurographica is a way of combining everything at once and doing a single thing. A lot of my colleagues with a really high status kept telling me, Pavel, everything you do is great, but what are you doing? Can you say a single thing? Are you doing it all at once? So, now I'm a drawing teacher. That's my title. Everything else comes after that. By the way, talking about drawing, our art school teaches classic academic painting, oil, canvas, watercolor. So it's classical art. And when I just came, there was a great flow of people drawing Neurographica. But how? So what do you think? Is art and Neurographica the same thing or are they different? Neurographica is first of all an art. Artist is the highest social status there is in the society at all. Since culture is created by society. Culture is created by society to become aware of itself and to be. So there is no higher social status than art. In Russian, art is iskustva, from the Greek techno, technology, skill, or a craft. And I mean art, not a craft, since there are crafts related to art, to the irrational. And there is poesis, and art is poesis, in Greek. People who are doing art, they are a part of society that have a legitimate right for a mystical, for an irrational vision. 
that have the right to communicate with reality without words. A dancer communicates with reality without words. But when people see how a dancer moves, something happens. When a scientist watches a performer dance, the formulas fall into place in his head. A dancer can convey a certain something through his dance, if it's a good dancer. A resonance with something higher? He or she channels the unknown into the known world. In Slavic cosmology, from the world of Nav into the world of Yav, people of art are the most sensitive elements of society, of nation, of people. It's a thin layer of people who are working with the unknown. There are also religious actors who are working with the unknown in a ritual way. I love good rituals. I love spiritual cultures and schools. But art is the most direct and straightforward kind of contact. When I'm saying that neurographic is art, this is what I mean first of all. It's a legitimate right to be mystical. Notice that it's not the right to know how everything is designed and what the stars are talking about, which can be right but can also be questioned. I mean this sensitivity to the unknown. When you take a white sheet and start drawing, but not the precise composition like the head of Apollo or Venus that you know how to construct. But instead, you are extracting something out of a white sheet, out of nothingness. Besides using the method we have, embedding this not knowing in your drawing. So through you, reality is able to reveal this something. And the fact that reality can reveal something that you can show to others and see and recognize yourself lies at the basis of our art, that's for sure. Second, I define what I'm doing and what we're doing as another turn in the history of the Russian avant-garde. I know art history as good as I can, I adore it, and I keep collecting, keep analyzing, as a philosopher, as a methodologist, I understand something about modern culture, about trends in the world. I realize how significant Russian avant-garde is. A hundred years ago, and periodically, at critical points in history, Russian people produced something that conquers everyone. A hundred years ago, Russia frightened everyone with communism. But at the same time, Russian avant-garde artists appeared and produced something that the world is still trying to process. There has been nothing more interesting in art for the last hundred years, more interesting than Russian avant-garde. Everything else is not conceptual, it's shallow, compared to the avant-garde that was launched by the Russians. So I'm saying that this is a continuation of avant-garde, since we have the same right now. Society is breaking apart, people are afraid, we are talking about things that the world is going to chew on, in a good sense, for a long time. What we're doing, and what the Institute is doing, and what the drawing people are doing, is a madly powerful art, and partly it is a political performance. We cannot compare ourselves to artists making paintings. This time of paintings, as a genre, in general has passed. Art currently requires the unknown, being in touch with people, it requires genres that are adequate to the time. New art is actually new genres that weren't there before. Are they more integrated? Yeah, it's rather a happening, a performance, and in fact, we are doing a performance right now. We are doing something for the people, but we are also interested. We are going to remember something, and change is going to happen inside of us. I'm not reading from my notes. It gets revealed from within me. This is my art opening up, being in touch with truth. And if you can be in touch with truth, your discovery will be useful for people. This might sound audacious, but Neurographica is in touch with the truth. Field lines and so on. People who are drawing Neurographica know what I'm talking about. People who see me for the first time might think that this man is getting carried away, talking about context in the truth. I'm aware of how provocative these statements are. But as a philosopher, I know that this is true and I can substantiate and prove it logically. However, going the illogical way is important for us, to live and feel the real experience. I was wondering myself, can neurographic drawings carry any value in terms of money as an art object? 
Were there any examples when people were drawing them for sale? I'm on a train, I'm drawing, they give you big napkins. So I take out a marker and start drawing. My daughter is beside me and she asks, what are you doing? I tell her, I'm earning money. You're always joking, she says. I tell her I'm not. But not to lose my face, I have to find a way to do it now. So I show her a napkin and tell her that we are going to sell it as soon as we get to Moscow. It can be, she says. So I finish my drawing, take a picture and upload it online with a text saying that this costs 150,000 rubles. And a lady meets me on the train platform and gives me the money. Moreover, I sold two drawings like that. I've done another one on the same train and it was purchased by another lady. My daughter started respecting me even more after that. She said, I thought it was a joke, but it's not. But this is just my experience. I don't rush to sell my drawings. My family tells me that everything is going to be sold however much I'm going to draw. My older brother, he's a very wise man, he knows art very well. He lives with art and makes money through art. He told me that however much you're going to draw, it will get sold. There are much more people out there. And the later I'm going to sell my artworks, the better. Maybe I'm not going to sell them. Maybe I will leave them to a museum. I need to leave something to my kids, so I don't rush to sell. I have plans to open a neuro art gallery in Moscow in 2023. Maybe in St. Petersburg too. We need a modern virtual gallery. We need NFTs. I'm looking at different ways of selling art. There was a lady studying at the same class with you. Maria Zakalata. She graduated the year before, I think. She's selling neurographic NFTs. They're not expensive in terms of NFTs, but she's able to sell them. There's also fashion. I really like when things get together on their own. I especially like the part about not rushing. If you rush, it costs you more. Art has to go past the period of initial trendiness to become sacred. This is when it becomes real art. I guess you can declare any drawing a work of art, but nevertheless, you have to make it well. Why am I making an art school, and what do I care about? Pure school is an ethical thing. This is about our responsibility before the society, so that we're all adequate and use proper names and terms. But neuro art school is about drawing skills. Can any person become an artist? Yes, any person can. But any person has to practice for seven years to become someone. If you do martial arts, you get a black belt in seven years, if you're doing it well. If you're interested in technology, then five years at university, two years at an internship, and you become someone. These are cycles of education described in ecmeological science, study of labor. Cognition has its own cycles. To become an artist, you have to make art professionally for seven years. When such people grow and develop, they make such drawings that they cost a lot. I understand that my drawings are going to have a special price tag, as if Freud was drawing. There is a special name on them, but they are also beautiful. It is a special genre. Well, we can create an artwork the size of a wall, four by five meters in only one day, and that's what I want to equip museums with. I want to do it in Spain. It's my personal project. I like that the Spanish created so many beautiful museums, but they're empty. Nothing happens. They don't have so much art. They have invested in the previous years. And at the start of the third millennium, there's a ton of exhibition space. I like Spanish people. Neurographica is on one hand avant-garde, and on the other hand, it's a truly Spanish thing. You know, Goya, Salvador Dali, El Greco, they feel it on the tips of their fingers. The Spanish are the most mystical of the European world. A lot of psychology in their paintings. Yes, that's true, they're mystical, and I know that they're going to accept Neurographica really well. So I want to do such large performances, and imagine there's a museum hall, and there's a performance going on for the whole week. Four walls of the hall are getting painted in a week. I'm going to invite our people, instructors, specialists. We're doing our work and the painting stays at the museum. It's going to become part of art history. 
Nobody has ever done this before, no one. The process of creating art is art itself. It's uniting. It's like a fish tank. Any visitor can step inside the artist's studio, become an artist. And an artwork itself is crazy in terms of the amount of energy, amount of labor. This is a new form. It has never been done before. Neurographica is an art of amazing power. Sometimes my brain is not enough. I need to study. I keep studying all the time. More than other people, believe me. I study every day. And sleep less and less. Sometimes I need to understand something myself, to find the right words, to become aware of what's happening through me, of what did I open up to. Each new artwork opens up new doors, and becoming aware of what is happening requires a lot of psychical energy. But this art is something that wasn't there before. Using the words of Dostoevsky, Neurographica will save the world. But not because Neurographica is psychological, but because it is art. This is really important, because it's an art. It's interesting. One more question that's asked very often. Can you show your artwork to someone? Can there be an evil eye effect in this context? Is your drawing going to have an effect on someone? On the show from 6 p.m. till 8 p.m. So you can show. Hiding your art? You know, I might suppose that, indeed, you need to hide some things from other people, something that can be critiqued, that can be judged, a problematic area, something that wasn't brought to a solution yet. If there is no solution in your drawing, it needs to be hidden away from view. But if there is a solution in your art, you can boldly display to people. This is what protects you. You can cover your windows with neurographic artworks, all the evil eyes are only going to jinx themselves. In fact, it's an amulet. It has harmony embedded in it. My goal is in showing people that Neurographica needs to be drawn properly. It needs to be drawn well. Some people declare that they came up with a hundred algorithms. But can you make one really well? When you're drawing it well, it becomes an amulet that protects you. It's an improvement every time. And there is nothing to be afraid of. All the bad influences, evil eyes and souls, and we are moving into the subtle realm, suggesting that all of this is real. So if it's real, all the people who try to have a bad influence on you are going to feel worse. And people drawing Neurographica start feeling more stable, protected, better and better. It's a different canon. Can you jinx someone looking at the church icon? You're going to have a hard time trying to jinx someone through a painting. It's of different nature. Can you drink someone looking at a Buddhist or Tibetan mandala? Who are you and who is behind the mandala? All the bad stuff just evaporates. You're investing a lot of energy in your drawing. Yes, and moreover, we are doing it with our own hands. This is not a print done by someone else. This was created by you and it has all of your power. So you need to display it. It's important for quality to grow. And what about a black marker? A block marker is the best thing ever for changing the world for the better. Not a rocket, not a projectile, not a machine gun or a dynamite, not chemistry or bacteriology, but a black marker is going to change the world for the better. This is what the miracle is about. We are performing an evolutionary transformation in a peaceful way. We are entering the metamodern age using a peaceful weapon. We don't even need to figure out who is our enemy. We find the enemy inside, draw, and our enemies disappear on their own. Of course, the world is illusory. I was talking to Buddha the other day and he asked, do you remember that the world is an illusion? I answered, well, of course. Okay, then go ahead, he said. Interesting. We've just had neurocolor course that's devoted to the theory of colors in Neurographica, and it's always a storm. I remember that there was a million questions on the instructor's course, a lot of criticism. The five stages that everything is following are very interesting. Why is it was saying that's at the basis of neurocolor? First off, I have a goal of making art more humane and making psychological practice more beautiful. Also, I have a lot of experience in my previous life before Neurographica, before Moscow, before I worked in business, when I worked in healing, in medicine, in therapy. When I'm telling people that we don't do therapy, I'm well aware of what I'm saying. 
It's not because I'm far from therapy. On the contrary, I know all the ethical norms very well and understand the specifics. The theory of Wusing is the only theory that I know of, and I know quite a lot. I dig deep like a good excavator. I'm trying to dig out all the knowledge I can get, and I process this knowledge a lot. So, Wusing theory of the five elements is the only comprehensive, universal theory that's accepted by the medical community. It is being taught. There are schools of reflexology, reflexotherapy, Chinese medicine. It's described and proven to work with their bodies. Its effectiveness is proven through experiments, in humanitarian disciplines, in pedagogy, in everything. It has been in existence for 5,000 years already. If something was able to persist for so long, you know that it's not dumb. You can call something dumb if it appeared the day before yesterday. You need to be connected to your roots. Finally, it's understandable. It might be a symbolic model, but it's clear, and it works. Everything works according to this model, whatever knowledge you take. So it's weird not using this model, especially since I know it really well and can teach it well. The question is, can there be any other models? Yes, there can. I can talk about the pyramid of development, about the colors of chakras, mandalas too. You mean a neuromandala having seven layers? Yes, this is because the world has seven layers along the vertical axis according to the pyramid. A sagittal cut of the human being? You've used the right words. Yes, a sagittal plane that also provides us with colors for a human being. With the Wusing, with the five elements, we get colors of the process. Often people don't hear it on the course. These are colors denoting phases of the process, be it development of the company, of a fetus, of a personal idea, regardless of scale. It might be planning your vacation next summer or your career 40 years ahead. The processes are going to be the same. So a sagittal plane of a human body is the right way to describe it. A seven-layered mandala and the seven colors make up a spectrum of colors, and the same colors can describe the endocrine system and the glands. Recently I came across these seven layers in Indian medicine. It's not seven bodies, but rather seven densities. Reich's muscular armor has the same several levels. So it is out there. And of course, we can achieve certain effects with colors. There have been lots of studies on how color affects us. We don't have to conduct our own studies. We can also use color when making oil paintings and watercolor, right? It's going to have an effect too. Yes, we can, formally. But from the graphics standpoint, a graphic plane we make doesn't give me the same kind of movement. We are not using fine motor scales the same way. In graphics, the number of lines is important. In watercolor, I put some water on my sheet, make a stain, and pow, archetyping took place. But the amount of labor we put in is not the same. And the stage when we can arrive at inspiration passes, though a drawing is really pretty. That's why I'm saying that a subject, a person, is more important than an object in this process. The point is not in how it looks in the end. The point is that I experience something on the way. I'm going through my own performance with this drawing I make. I don't need to go to the theater, to the movies. I experience so much more through this tool. That's why I'm fighting so hard for the graphic part. I can tell you a secret. You might be the first person who hears this. You're going to have watercolor classes in our neuro art school. So neuro art is more loosely defined. Feels too obvious to confirm that. Okay, it is interesting. As a doctor, I can say that most of the cortex that deals with movement is responsible for fine motor skills. The fine motor skills are signs of our evolution. Animals have hooves, higher animals have five fingers or something like that. So it made us who we are? 
By mastering our fine motor skills, we became who we are. Some scientists are puzzled by the fact that our neocortex suddenly developed for no apparent reason. But it happened together with manual labor, and so on and so on. Actually, handwriting is the finest skill we have. And also, we lead the line in a special way. This is not just a standard drawing technique. No, this is not your hand spontaneously twitching in its own, making you happy. There is no such thing as a spontaneous drawing. It's rather a reflective drawing. We have to be aware at every moment. What we're doing is amazing, especially in the modern world. People often ask me, besides asking how I came up with Neurographica, so I have to come up with new answers all the time. So they also ask me, how are you going to save the world? And actually it's simple. Everyone seems to know what the Third World War is going to be like. It looks like it's going on already. But what about the Fourth World War? Futurologists have this concept, and it's going to be about the fight of artificial intelligence with natural intelligence, a war with machines. We have a lot of anti-utopia movies like The Terminator and that kind describing all the horrors. It was long before the Third World War but I was saying that we've lost the fourth one. And not even lost, we gave up. And we didn't give up to AI, we gave up to the keyboard. People are horrible because they give up handwriting. Ask anyone of the last time they were handwriting, and people are going to look down on their feet. If you ask to show their handwriting, people are going to run away. We've lost this skill. Pavel Mikhailovich has phenomenal handwriting. That's because I'm learning to do it. I'm writing in cursive copybooks, a grown-up man, a professor. Just normal ones, like in school? Yes, I can show you, it's over there. I'm teaching my daughter handwriting, since this is a skill that made us human. This is the finest motor skill, handwriting. People could define what kind of a person you are by your calligraphy a hundred years ago. Dostoevsky had to pass calligraphy exam in technical school. It shows that you're able to master your brain in general. People have turned all the letters into this woodpecker move, click-clack on the keyboard. All the fine motor skills became a single movement. People gave up. And this is what I'm angry about. As soon as people return to handwriting, they come alive. They're becoming strong again. Writing by hand, sending letters, postcards, is a bit silly nowadays. It's no longer practical. So Neurographica brings people back to the skill and saves them since these movements are what stand behind our evolution. I feel confident about each individual that can develop this skill using a pen or a stylus. I feel he is free from the threat of Parkinson's. I don't worry about his intellectual function. I'm sure this person is going to be sane. There are some creatures out there that are really insane and that just cannot take their hands off the keyboard. Take your hands off the keyboard is the command people don't get. This is one of your most popular phrases at the instructor's course. Because people are just so attached to these chats, keep writing without understanding what they're actually saying, mindlessly. I'm afraid, I'm really scared. 20 years after, people are going to walk the streets this way, without the keyboard. I'm only joking, my friends. Sometimes I'm getting carried away by this role. This is just for the sake of clarity. Artificial intelligence has created a model of a human being that we are going to have in future if things keep going the same way. A crooked hand, a hump on the back, a grabber for a device. Yeah, just a grabber. Machines will make humans into robots. Robots have their manipulators and the human being is going to have his. So draw neurographica, my friends. Are there any regional differences in teaching in different countries? Yes, there are. Is there a difference in mentality? Yes, it matters a lot. We have a German group of countries, Austria, Germany, Switzerland, they are different. They have a different temperament, different things touch them. For them, it is important that this is a smart approach, that it's algorithmical. They are less emotional, so they are charmed by how open and emotional we are. But they are more methodological. They are creating wonderful artworks, we have great instructors there. So you have branches of the institute there? Yeah, of course, we have branches of the institute. 
All of this is copyright protected, so no one can use it without my consent. Like if someone wrote a screenplay for Avatar, nobody can use it to make their own movie. So Neurographica is a proprietary brand. Just like all the other brands, I'm aware that I'm creating a valuable original product. I'm trying to keep my product pure. If someone rewrites Tolstoy's War and Peace in his own manner, this is no longer Tolstoy and no longer War and Peace, but something else. My work is also original, and it has its own ethics, its administrative and legal aspects. But that's not the point. The point is that every person is creating beautiful artworks, unique, different. Each class is different. When I travel, I teach the same algorithm in a different manner. I speak at a different pace, self-reflection takes a different time, I go without haste, all the questions are different. They like that I can connect and link everything together. My doctoral dissertation is about the universal theory of humanitarian knowledge. It's about the theory of the meta-modern. I know German philosophy and German psychology really well. So it makes an impression, the fact that I can tell them things an average person doesn't know. Even a well-educated person cannot talk about it as clearly as I can talk about the results of my research. So they're really curious about it. So you have to find the key to your audience. Yes, and Bulgarians are really different. There is even more spirituality than with the Russians. They're all about Sophia, wisdom. They like the fact that we are moving towards wisdom and that they are taking part in the spirit of Sophia, the spirit of wisdom. Spirituality in the Russian-speaking space is more about energy, energetics. Energy of Siberia, you know, is shamanic energy. It's not directly related to orthodoxy. And Bulgarians don't have a problem connecting it to orthodoxy. I know some Bulgarians ask their clergy for an opinion, and they said it's wonderful. Not in the sense that it's a wonder, but that's right, it's beautiful, adequate. Israelites are different. They have full-blown coaching going on. They like to talk, to make noise, to discuss. I tell them, don't forget about drawing. They say, sure, of course, we're drawing. An English course is different. There are Americans, British, Chinese, Burmese students studying the course at the same time. There is a man from Nepal studying in the course. I found him online. He has lots of pictures of neurographic drawings. He keeps sending me messages. He told me that he presented Neurographica at a symposium in Nepal with 500 doctors at a symposium in India. I tell him, why don't you learn what you teach? He's so ecstatic. This is so divine, so magical for him. I'm sorry if I seem arrogant. This is just my humor. He tells me, you're the Shiva of Neurographica. Neurographica is the teaching of Shiva and starts ranting on about this. I try to lure him into learning more, into studying, and he's like, wow, I didn't know you have this too. They like to have faith. That's their mentality. That's their culture of getting to know the mystical. Every person takes something for himself. We have things getting started in Latin America, and I think it's going to be incredibly bright. Like Borges, like Cortazar, they have a totally different culture. If you've been there, you know, they have their green, it's different. The color green is different there, and everything feels different in the Andes, and it makes total sense. I like that we have the same stylistic moments in art, but still, every person makes it his own unique way. But the style is the same, it's defined. Just like cubism is defined by cubes, I'm sorry if it sounds cliché or rather anecdotal, but it's true, cubism is defined by cubes. I like telling people about Eji Konorsky, neuroplasticity, Giacomo Rizzolatti, mirror neurons, Fritz Perls, but not everyone feels interested. People want to draw their dream. Where is the algorithm for drawing a dream? That's what people want. Is it normal? People are simpler. When people come to the market with vegetables, greens, strawberries and stuff, they forget of their academic degrees. They just need to choose something real. And as soon as something real appears, Everything artificial gets washed away and people just get their problems solved. I have PhDs writing, almost whispering to me, Pavel Mikhailovich, don't tell anyone, 
but if I draw a neurographica, are things really going to work themselves out? I say, well, you can try drawing it, it might. PhDs are people too. Yes, there are people who want to go deeper, who want to feel more interest. That's how their brain is wired. They need to have it cooking. They feel ecstasy from the thinking process itself. I feel ecstasy when philosophies, cultures integrate. I literally feel ecstasy. The path to ecstasy is short. If you know the layers of culture well, these layers are neural networks. These are networks in the noosphere. And if I'm able to connect to cultural layers, to egregores, yes, to egregores, then my brain starts working differently at a different power level. A cultural collider is working. The algorithm NeuroCollider is not accidental. Irina Rostestina came up with the algorithm and I came up with the name, since apparently it is a collider, and I am proud that I recognized it as a collider, and bravo to Irina who invented it. By the way, how Irina got into teaching? She is the only instructor teaching the course with you. Katerina Sorokina also joins our team of teachers in 2023. She's finished her PhD and doing a lot of work. Irina Rajdestina was the last student to enroll in the first instructor's course. By the way, she contacted me after enrollment was closed. So I see that a lady sends me a message and her name is Irina Rajdestina. And I'm the person who reads signs. Can I refuse the person with such a last name? Rajdestva is Christmas or birth in Russian. This is a sign from God, a message definitely. As a psychologist, I don't have the right to be mystical. As a head of the institute, I have no right for mysticism at all. However, as an artist, I can read all the signs I want. And voila, Rajdestina, a new birth. Of course, open the door, that's what I can say. So she stayed and is one of the best people of our school to this day. We have done so much together and she has invested so much labor, so much talent. Many people open up with us and I like it. That's why I'm doing psychology. I like to be where people discover and reveal their potential. That's the best place to be on earth, where people open up like that. That's why I lead workshops. My friend is sitting over there. I've known him for over 30 years and he knows that I've always been like that. I deliberately create situations that make us live well. To live well, people need to reveal their best qualities. I'm doing all I can to let people discover their best sides in my presence. That's why I feel goodness is flowing to me. That's it. The law of the commune is very simple. It's about your contribution to the common good, to the delight of life, to creativity. If it's not harmful, let's do it. It is curious. We are always trying to solve problems, fulfill dreams. Neurographica can help with a lot of stuff. But people often say, I feel fine already. Why do I need to draw? Can you answer? If you don't have any problems, life gets boring. Why do you live? What for? Living in Nirvana is good, but a bit boring. I know what I'm talking about. You can create your path to Nirvana. You go to a retreat once in a while, you meditate daily, you do your Qigong, and you might have access to Nirvana, but it feels boring there, though incredibly good. But there are also personal problems, and each person has his own set of problems. And if there is none, they are easy to create. So if you don't have a problem, you can create it, challenge yourself? Of course. Even if your income is so big, it feels uncomfortable, you can multiply it by 10. You can give away what you don't need and create a problem by scaling up. Scale up. Improve your education. Even if you don't really need it. I know I have enough education for two lives probably, but I keep telling myself I know so little, I don't know this and that and I feel such a nobody here. I'm afraid of the formula of self-love, of people who are too obsessed with self-love. I think it's a childhood gestalt. Do I love myself? Do I feel loved? That's what kids might say. This kind of rhetoric is quite popular today. This is not even a rhetoric. It's other monologues of self-love that are going on for 10 years already. This is really immature. As soon as you love yourself, you stop growing. What I'm talking about is the controlled absence of self-love. In certain aspects, I can reach the level of disrespect and even hatred for myself. I've had periods in my life when I was 30 kilograms heavier than I am right now. 
So I told myself, hold on, it is impossible to love myself in this state. Until I look at my own feelings for myself, with a cold head, feelings for my material state, my physical state, my communications, until I can judge myself honestly, I won't make any corrections in life. Life is a correctional labor facility, even though it might look as beautiful as this studio. But this is in fact a correctional labor camp. I feel pleasure at the seaside, since there are all conditions for me to feel good. But anyways, even there I come up with different challenges, like swimming 5k, walking along the beach, spending the night under the sky. Leave the comfort zone, stop the self-love, stop spoiling yourself. I understand that this is a masculine position, a truly Zen style, but everyone who's engaged in self-development create these special zones of discomfort, zones of absence of self-love. These zones are where you actually claim back your self-love and grow in scale as a person. This is it. So you can keep coming up with new and new challenges. Yes, you know, you might be living well, but it gets boring. It's not a myth, I checked. Countries with high standards of living have a high rate of suicide. They don't have any problems. Here's a problem for you. Learn to draw the neural line. Here's the problem to work on. Learn to do it or find a different problem and life is no longer boring. It reminds me of a famous experiment with rats, where they had the perfect conditions. They had plenty of food and water and they ended up destroying each other. Only guinea pigs flourish in perfect conditions. Everyone else feels bored. Cows also seem to give milk really well in perfect conditions. A human being is a special case. It needs conditions that are not perfect. Since we've created such a complex of adaptations and such a cunning mind, we have such an array of things that take away our sense of life, that we've actually lost touch with life in the process. We don't sense life anymore. We don't feel pleasure from walking. I had a person visiting me today who said, after climbing the stairs, now I understand why you are the way you are. And that's true. It was a deliberate choice to have a house without an elevator. Of course, I use an elevator if there is one, but I keep in mind that I have to do my yoga, my qigong, I have to fight, to swim. This is being truly alive. I like Neurographica very much because you stress the fact that you need to actually do something, not just talk. Our fourth type of algorithms are algorithms of action. Yes, like Neurogoal, we've recently been drawing it. How do you treat drawing skills in general? What about classic drawing skills? You mentioned that you're an artist, first of all. Does it help with drawing Neurographica? The best jazz man is the one who has classical musical education. So, of course, if you've mastered the tool, a pencil, a marker, or a brush, if you feel the line, of course, it's going to look beautiful. But there's a different problem. It's the same we have in non-traditional medicine, in non-traditional drawing. You become the slave to the algorithms that you are taught. I am an architect, and you can imagine how a good architect is drawing. I've learned to draw really well. So it was really hard to start for me, to come up with a neural line, since you have to deal with technical drawing, with constructions, geometry, perspective. That's how your brain is wired. You become narrow-minded. This is a model, a model that's hard to free yourself of. It's hard not to despise it, since I have a school of architectural graphics where I teach people architectural drawing. It's just a different kind of people. Learning something different requires a solid work on your ego. You might have invested five years into an art school or an institute, five years into work, and then you're told, draw differently. And what was the point then? It is a professional conflict. Who am I in that case? This is where neuroplasticity has its roots, right? Yes, that's right. It's rooted here and stems from here. When people say they see hearts or butterflies in their drawing, we say that we strive for abstraction, right? Yes, abstract art can provide more meanings, more integration. If you see a heart, you won't see a liver. But when you have a geometric shape, it can be both a heart and a liver. Abstract art is more integrative. This is interesting. What if a person wants to draw for the other person? 
Some people say they want to draw world peace or health for their friends. Can they do that? I can run a marathon for the other person, but I am the one who is going to benefit. I can even give him the medal and a diploma, but I am the one who is going to benefit. It's the same, but not completely the same. All the people who complete the instructor's course gain access to understanding how to draw for the other people, or using different words, how can you solve other people's problems but drawing yourself? You need to be advanced to do it. I can try telling about it, but out of 1200 people, about 1000 will say, I can do that, and will rush to do it. Let's not make some things trivial. The most complicated things are often the ones they want to trivialize. However, it's something you have to arrive at. I don't even want to discuss it with the non-instructors. I can discuss it with people who are studying at Neuro Healing Course. That's where we literally study healing, helping other people. I want to know who those people are. You know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid that my creation is going to be used to harm others. It's something that's going to touch my karma, my life, and me personally in the end. That's why, in this case, I better give less, keep silent. I don't need extra fame or extra money. I have enough of everything. For me, it's important to keep purity. I'm afraid of falsifications and commercialization. Some people say, Neurographica has become too commercial. However, it didn't. It did not become a commercial thing. When I observe people trying to do a purely commercial thing, in two or three months, they give up, because Neurographica makes people better. If you don't draw well, you're never going to sell it, because you're trying to get commercial about it, because you use internet marketing or have a sharp mind. People can see whether you draw well or badly. When I see commercial projects in Neurographica, the artworks are usually stolen. They use other artists' artworks. But if you're drawing well, your commercial side gets tame. You achieve a balance. Each of us needs to have a commercial side that's normal. And thank God, I want people to live well. But nobody needs all the extra whipped cream, if you will. Especially the people who feel beauty. Your need for all the excesses just disappears. I know people who came through the commercial peak, dropped down a bit, and then acquired this beauty, arrived at it. They have acquired a treasure much more valuable than anything you can buy for money. So their initial ambitions settle down. I also know people who have reached commercial peaks and then just dropped down to absolute zero, totally. Interesting. And what's the secret? I can tell such stories, but I don't want to denigrate anyone. There is not so many stories like that, but it happens. What's the secret of success for instructors then? We know a number of successful instructors, they are bright and famous in being adequate, having a balance, a balance of inner and outer work. This is it. You know something in your field, like medicine, healing, you feel it and you might succeed in it. Someone might have success in pedagogy. Nobody has to be the same star. There are as many stars as people. Every person is unique. What is important is to be happy. There is no single answer. Every person has a unique scale and configuration of his own good, of his own happiness, a unique personality. When you find your own configuration, your envy for others disappears. You are so content with yourself that you are grateful to God that you are the way you are. You are the way you are. Hooray! Someone lives in Bali, someone lives at a different place. Isn't it better rushing around Bali earning money? It is indeed better. Anyone who spent some time in Bali or in Thailand knows that. But I get bored. I can't sit in Thailand for too long. I want to get moving. I like to drive a car. My teachers are here. But that's not the point. People can discover their own potential, their charisma, within their own configuration of the world, through their own avatar, their own diversity. And this is wonderful. And it's pleasant that we can get together. 
pleasant that we have such a community of professionals. People don't just run in all directions after graduation. We like being together, and nobody's going to say a single bad word. Of course, I see women hissing at each other from time to time, that's normal. Boris Grabinshikov from Aquarium Band had a song that every woman needs to have a snake inside. It's greater than me and greater than you. We have such a mantra, but in general we are benevolent. It seems to me that you are the only man in neurographical world, I mean, a higher level. What about Sergei Zhuchkov? He's rather an exception. But why do we need them? When colleagues ask me, Piskarev, why do you only have women? And I answer that, I'm a man. I'm a man and I don't even have a fantasy of attracting other men. I don't have such a fantasy, I fantasize of women. So you can tell my analyst and your analyst that I fantasize about women, this is normal. I think I have to ask our women why there is no man. I worked with a male audience, it was really exciting. I think our women have to bring more men into Neurographica. Women are scaring men off by being so mystical, metaphysical, with their magical thinking. They need a different approach. Yes, maybe more rational. I think men need neurodesign and neurobionica, where we work with the body. We have such courses. If some of the men get interested, we have special schools at the institute. I'm inviting to join them, even though they're not so numerous. They're not so well known as Neurographica. You know, Neurographica opens up, and the principle of opening up is natural for a woman. A true state of happiness for a woman is being open, in all senses of the word. There's a saying that a woman's happiness is in your yes, in your openness. What about men? For men it's the opposite, in self-limitations, in his no, in discipline, being firm, ascetic, so he is more concentrated. So it opens up for those men who reach the point of revealing their anima. While a man is still working on his rigid male configuration, stuck in it, he is not fully realized as a man. Opening up is hard. It's related to losing the power he accumulated. He needs to push himself to the limit, and different things are needed there. For a woman, it's much different. If a woman opens up, she feels better right away. Neurographica is good for structuring thoughts, your body. Structuring is what the school of neurodesign is about. This is the next step. Design is studied after graphics. What is neurodesign about? Can you tell? I need to show. I have some objects here. The pyramid, Bogoban. So these are coaching models, intellectual. Yes, these are intellectual models, analytical coaching. It is about thinking. For neurographers, neurodesign is clearly about working within a fixing shape. So we are looking for a solution with the help of a marker. Neurographica leads you to find an affixing shape. Neurodesign is working with an affixing shape directly. An affixing shape is the shape of our solution, and neurodesign is all the work with the field of possible solutions. Talking about an affixing shape, can there be several affixing shapes? Depends on the composition. The problem is that an affixing shape organizes the movement of your thought. Your task is to choose. A lady receives three offers, going to work, marrying, and something else. Like a hero on the crossroads. You need to choose which way to go. If you have three affixing shapes, you stay at the crossroads. Your brain is fine and everything is fine until you have three affixing shapes. You might be a hero, but now you arrive at this crossing and suddenly there are three shapes. You have no idea where to go. If you have a single shape, you won't have any questions. Having a single affixing shape means that all the energy of a positive solution feeds the only right solution there is. And that's it. I know that rarely, but it happens that you want to have two shapes or several. In this case, you need to study composition. Any painting has a dominant. You can take Joconda or The Red Horse by Petrov Vodkin. And there is going to be a dominant in the composition. If there is no dominant, it's a different kind of work. 
a different field, it's like Filonov's art or something of that sort. If our goal is having a solution, solving a problem, you need a single solution. You don't need two projects for building a house. You are going to go crazy, you won't have enough budget, you only need a single house. You need a single project for a family for the nearest three years. No need to think for three families, you'll get torn apart, you won't have enough time. It's the same with everything. You need to invest a budget into something, and you don't need two budgets, you need a single budget for a year. So we are drawing a single shape with a closed outline. Yes, each time we need a single solution. Getting used to stopping this hesitation. This is what I'm talking about. Stop thinking and start acting. There's a famous work by a French sociologist, I forgot his name. It has a landmark name, published about 20 years ago at the end of the 20th century. It's called The Return of the Man of Action. All the thinking is needed just to prevent yourself from acting, pitying yourself, staying inside, avoiding conflict, avoiding real communication, just sitting down thinking. At the age of modernism, you were paid for being smart, but nowadays, for being smart, you'll only get good marks at school. Life doesn't encourage you for that in any way. The task before you is not being smart, but pardon if it sounds trivial, being effective, proficient. You come in, do your thing, and you're free. You know the right decision and have no inner doubts, existential pain subsides. No more of Rodin's The Thinker, no more of Dante's Hell. All of it disappears, you just do it well and live well. If you do something well, you live well. If you don't want to live well, go ahead, hesitate. No one's making you do it. More on the fixing shape. It seemed to me that you're not always using it. While I was studying at the instructor's course, students had to remind you of an affixing shape so that you would show it. It only seems like that, first of all. You have your own rich inner world where lots of things are going on, that's good. Second, you're right, I don't always do myself what I give as an assignment to students. Since I'm drawing my own personal cases, not just examples for you, I fill them through. When I'm drawing a case or a project, I create conditions in the field, I launch the thinking process, I know that I'm going to keep on drawing the next day, I might have another workshop after that. I always complete my cases. We have different kinds of classes. Sometimes I might just sit and draw field lines. I might just sit drawing field lines and probably in my own process, I am deeper than some of the others. I'm not being arrogant, this is just my regular practice. So I don't have to push it to completion every time. Sometimes a massive power needs to be unfolded that matches my global project. It is a miracle that thanks to Neurographica, I started doing global projects. Global, not because the word itself sounds pleasant, but since it's true. The whole world is doing it. One idea gets global, then another one. I was scaled up there, thanks to field lines. I sleep upon field lines. I don't need to fix something each time. I teach people to do it, but I don't have to repeat it myself, if this is something for first graders. Again, I'm not being arrogant. I can teach everyone and everything, but I don't have to be the same with my students. So it's a personal thing. Of course, I'm working with my own life. I'm showing everything I do. I feel it inside. And thank God you can notice certain things. If you need an affixing shape, okay, you made me do it. I'm going to draw it to calm you down. Explaining it every time is too much. Learn the alphabet. And I'm going to offer a different explanation. I can apologize before the audience that I'm living in a bit of a different world, being a bit ahead. But aren't you curious about saying something new? Believe me, in a hundred years, everyone is going to talk about us. Our descendants are going to talk about us. People who will stay long enough with us will be discussed. So cases of people who were first are, in fact, cases for descendants. And this is important to realize. In fact, we are all taking part in history. And you can take part too if you feel interested about it, about becoming an historical figure. Neurographic is quite young, eight years. Of course only eight years since the word itself was born. 
We mentioned Freud today, and he spent eight years just trying to publish an article so that someone would read him. So I guess time is speeding up for us, but I'm not sure it's speeding up for everyone else. Nobody is doing anything, nothing's happening. Another interesting question from a student. If we are doing an exercise at the start or the end of the drawing, when we are writing down a list of words, what if strange words appear, words that have no meaning, some abracadabra? There are nonsensical words in Bulgakov novels, you might have been inspired by him. This is not the case. It's not a foreign word, it has no translation. Maybe it's a signal from the unconscious? Maybe it's some sort of a channeling? Once I watched a video where a channeler, a woman was asked about Iskarov and Neurographica. I was shown this video with her talking like... pure gibberish. And then she shook it off and went on, ranting about the new age coming and the message from the Alderaan star saying that we're giving good to people. You know what kind of information might come through people. What's important is our self-reflection. The words themselves are not important. What emotions, what images rise up within me? How does my inner world get blown up with these words? This is what's important. So processing those words is important. We're reflecting. Processing is an intellectual thing. Meaning is one of the phases of a mindfulness practice of self-reflection, so we feel them, sense them. They make us visualize certain things, and we visualize within our own frame of reality. You cannot visualize something completely alien to you, even though it might happen with sounds, that what sounds are like. What do you think is the reason for such popularity of Neurographica? There seems to be an explosion, especially during the quarantine. It seems that everyone started drawing. People are looking for salvation. People got locked inside. Things they based their life upon turned into nothing. These things might have been significant in the past or had a meaning under other conditions. But suddenly, with the pandemic, in locked spaces, in solitude, what can you do? Psychoanalysis? You need to define your role, who's the analyst, and exchange roles at least. Our process is very honest, effective, it's pretty, good-looking. You may be sitting in Chelyabinsk, a not-so-sunny place, or somewhere else, in St. Petersburg. Also, the winter is grey, but now you have bright markers, and your receptors perceive color, perceive something related to different meanings. I guess we are at a different age. This is a tool of a different age. I don't think that what I'm inventing, what comes through me, is the only thing there is. A hang drum is another thing. It's an instrument of the new age, celestial music. Yes, but it was invented only in 2010. It sounds like it was around for eternity, like some shamans were playing it for thousands of years. There are other similar phenomena. This age gives birth to them. Moreover, I think that the Russian world is going to give birth to a lot of stuff. And not because I'm a patriot. I have an Israeli passport. I have four different bloodlines. I have various locations and countries that I consider my own around the world. I just realized that you're at the age of the North and that this is where the Great Spirit has come to. You're going to have a great spiritual uplift soon. We might be pioneers of this creative uplift. We might be the first to reach these lands, like during the Klondike Gold Rush. If you're the first to reserve your spot, it's yours. But there are other things to appear too. A different pharmacology, a different kind of dance, not just classical Russian ballet. Other things will emerge when people start creating new stuff. The fact that we have such a cultural breakdown is also good, since the tradition of old authorities is getting washed away. Young people have an opportunity to do things differently. A breakdown always means new opportunities. You're right. We've had a revolution a hundred years ago. It hit us hard, but we have an experience of a cultural transformation, not war, but a cultural transformation, being the avant-garde. I believe, I think so, and it's described in my theory, I talked about it before war started, that the spirit of creativity, the spirit of life, is returning back here, to the northern territories, 
We have a great potential and great experience for it. Experience of survival during such evolutionary leaps. Surviving evolutionary leaps is also an important experience. What is awaiting neurographica in future? Nothing special, it's going to save the world. Everyone is going to draw. You think the whole planet is going to draw? Of course. It's going to happen easily. I remember when Bill Clinton was elected, there was a journal article saying that Clinton is the first American president who plays the saxophone and who smokes marijuana. He was a representative of the new generation, so I'm waiting for a president who is going to draw neurographica. Nothing special. Maybe from school or his mother taught him, a Russian or an American president, it doesn't matter. Let their president smoke marijuana and our president is going to draw neurographica. Maybe Bruce Willis is going to draw. Pavel just recently said that he wants to draw with Bruce Willis. I'm going to talk about it on Sunday. Not only Willis, I have a couple of questions for Elon Musk. We are definitely going to pull him in. Yeah, looks like his kind of thing. And now, a couple of short questions. You can give short answers too, or you might hide your answer. Sure. Black or white? Black. Circle or triangle? Circle. Fire or water? Water. Pencils or markers? Markers. Freight or you? Jung. ARL or neurotree? What? Algorithm for removing limitations or neurotree? A neurotree. When are we going to meet again? On the streets of St. Petersburg. Thank you so much. Thank you.